Pashta Hona, in Pima and Poti, Autonom Itza, Ishentios de San Macomichoch, de San Macomi Sakan, Ishentios de Nohak, Ishentios Ishmukan, Ishentios Piacok, Ishentios Mamishna, Ishentios Mishna, Ishentios de Pu, Ishentios Kukumats. So, hello, Ani Sego. Um, my name is Maria, my last name is Montejo. Um, I just gave a protocol of introduction to the ancestors um, of this land that we are interviewing in. Um, so Dorum Ganotza, um, the program itself um, is an education and cultural facility. Uh, Dodem is a word that is an Anishinaabe word that means clan or family. And so I can spend a lifetime explaining what Dodem means, so I won't, but I'll give you an idea. It's a family that you pertain to, and it could be an animal family, could be an energy family, could be of a spirit, like the little people family. Um, and Ganonsa is a Ganyankahaga word, which is a Mohawk uh, word that means lodge. So Dodem Ganonsa is the clan lodge. So it's where all the different clans can come and gather. And our program is now in its 21st year of operation, um, and it's in the heart of Toronto. And our principal mandate is to bring Indigenous and non-Indigenous people together in a safe learning space so that they can um, build their awareness on Indigenous rights, um, culture, and history, um, and build their relationship um, to the land that we're sitting on and standing on. and. Um, move forward in more harmony, acceptance, and understanding between each other. Um, so that's our principal mandate. Um, and we're in partnership with the federal government, now known as Indigenous Services Canada, previously known as um, Indian Affairs. Um, and the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto is our home agency. So it's a partnership that's been going on for 21 years now. Um, and it's a, it's a proud partnership, it's a good partnership that we have. Um, so our principal audience is all people, um, all people from all different ages, um, primarily adults, and it's primarily adult education. Um, but our educators are um, indigenous wisdom keepers, um, known in modern times as elders, but we would call them grandmothers or grandfathers. Um, knowledge holders, um, scholars, academics, indigenous individuals who carry wisdom that they can provide to the public or staff of Indigenous Services Canada so that that relationship can move forward in a good way. Dorm Ganotza came about as a result of the Oka crisis. So in the 1990s, the Oka crisis happened in what people would refer to as Quebec today. Um, and I won't go too much into detail in terms of what the Oka crisis was, except that it impacted us in a profound way that we became aware that um, many Canadians had very little to no knowledge on Indigenous history, cultural rights. Um, even more scary was that um, the staff members of the federal government, in particular at that time known as Indian Affairs, the federal department, um, had very little to no knowledge on Indigenous history and culture, yet we're making decisions that were impacting Indigenous people in profound ways. And so many people had no understanding that the territory in, in Quebec was unceded territory, therefore occupied by what we would call Canadians today. And so most people have a hard time understanding what those words mean and what we're talking about. So when the people, um, the Ginnikahaga people, the nation, uh, were defending their inherent rights, their natural rights, their ancestral rights, um, many people did not understand that. And the result of that was a lot of violence and discrimination and a lot of harm towards indigenous peoples and the nations and the, the little people, the family, the community. So it became so apparent that um, there needed to be a facility in which um, federal staff could come and learn and educate themselves. Um, and we could bring together people um, that were Indigenous and non-Indigenous to learn about um, that history and, and contemporary issues um, so that that violence wouldn't have to reoccur. And so the first lodge was built in Gatineau 
which is the Kumik facility. And then the Ontario region decided that they needed one as well. And so that's where the birth of Dodem Kanotsa came about um, 21 years ago in 1998 in September. And so that's how we were built. And the facility was built in such a way where it was important to have a partner. So the federal government thought of the, the staff members there, thought that it was important, the indigenous staff members in particular, um, felt it was really important to have a facility. Um, and then they looked for a partner, which was the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto. And so the manager for the facility, um, there's only it's only staffed by one individual, which is me in this moment in time, which is the manager of the facility. And they would be um, hired and then supervised by the Native Canadian Centre. So I'm in partnership with the federal government, but I don't work for the federal government. Um, and then it was believed that um, this partnership would allow for the best possible programming to come about. And there would be advisory committee members from each um, of the partners that would come together and support the manager in terms of the programming and the logistics of the facility. And that's been in place for 21 years now. And so, the facility really um, has a mandate, right? But the vision of it depends on who the manager is that comes through those doors, right? Um, and it's built that way. Um, so when they hire the manager, they're looking for particular skills and knowledge, um, in particular, whether they have um, lived experience in an Indigenous community, whether they have language, whether they um, understand the historical and contemporary issues experienced by Indigenous peoples. Um, and so every manager that has come through the facility, and there's been many, has built the facility and contributed to its growth in many unique ways and beautiful ways. Um, and so we're always thankful for every manager that has been here. Um, but I can't speak about the particular vision they had or how they brought it together. But for myself, um, I have a degree in Indigenous history um, from McMaster University. But more important than that is I have the lived experience of being Indigenous, but also of um, spending the majority of my time in ceremony with the grandmothers and grandfathers and living on the land. And, and attending it. So it's, it's part of my everyday life. Um, and so I bring that to this particular role that I have as the manager. And from that and from having a contemporary uh, relationship with Indigenous nations and communities outside of the city, but also within the city, so the urban community um, is really important as well. And so all those relationships and that ex experienced um, life life experience and um, as well as the historical knowledge because you need a little bit of, of academic in there, right? Those books and stuff. Um, I bring that to this role and do my best to be able to um, have a vision as to what kind of programming would benefit um, the public and the staff. And so I spent a lot of time consulting um, the grandmothers and grandfathers for what what they see is needed, um, what they what their gifts are, and what they would like to bring into the programming. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, speaking and engaging with them. And so sometimes there's some elders that um, are really have this deep connection to the water, right? So I'll have them come in and do water ceremony or teachings. And then there's some elders that are really you know, gifted in the area of plant medicines or the land and spend, have spent 30 plus years working with those medicines. So I'll have them come in and talk about that relationship with those plant beings um, and the spirit that's in each plant. Some elders are incredible at um, knowing the historical um, experiences like the trees and the land claims and um, the different laws and rights that are out there so we'll get them to come and so every grandma and grandfather has a whole life of experience and they have particular gifts and so I focus on what their gifts are and what they're passionate about and then I create programming based on that 
um, how those gifts will um, support the needs of um, the public or the staff in terms of their learning. And so I match it together. And, and um, But the most important um, process that I have is what we call um, working with the tobacco or the SEMA. Um, so I work with, um, with that tobacco and I ask um, what we would call from the unseen world, the ancestors, a lot for them to give me insight into what workshop or what education session needs to come forward. And that's difficult at times for um, our mainstream world because it doesn't always follow logic, <laughs> right? And so sometimes I'll, I'll just get a feeling like I need to have a workshop on fire and on the sun. And if you ask me, you know, what's the logic behind that? I'll just say I had an impulse or something came to me um, after praying with the tobacco that said, you need to have this workshop. And in my experience, um, people will come out of the workshop and say, that's exactly what I needed to hear, right? And so really that's an indigenous methodology where we work with this medicine to, um, to talk to that unseen world, those ancestors and those original teachers to help us and guide our programming. So that's the principal way I do it. And then I have other methods as well. And we have, um, we're very lucky here where the elders, the grandparents and the knowledge keepers, those wisdom keepers are the leaders. And so they're the ones that really guide us. Um, and that's really a, a beautiful thing that the facility is able to um, have, right? And so, even though we have an advisory committee um, and we have kind of some parameters of how the programming is supposed to move, it, that's secondary to what the grandparents are saying, right? So, um, so we don't have a lot of pressure as other programmings have, programs have in terms of hitting this particular number and this amount of people. Um, that's not how we operate here. Although we do keep st statistics, like general statistics of how many people are coming in, just to give an idea of like um, numbers, right? Like in terms of like being staffed by one person and having this amount of resources, how many people are coming in, right? So is it the adequate amount of resources? So we do keep some statistics, um, but in terms of our um, evaluation or how we know the program is being successful, it really comes from the stories um, that the participants share with you. So when the participants come to, to see an elder or to sit in a workshop, and when we hear those words, this really changed the way that I think, so their beliefs or the way that I feel, their attitude, or the way that I see the world, their insights, when they share that, that's, that's how we know we're being successful because there is a shift in their beliefs, values, or attitudes, um, and they now see the world in a different way. Um, and the relationships that are forged between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So those stories that people share with us, that's how we know that it's been successful. Well, Dorum Ganota is really in the heart of a large city, Toronto. And there really is no other facility like Dorum Ganota in this massive city and so we are a resource that's really needed and that's how we've been <laughs> very successful and staying alive for 21 years um, but there but there's some challenges that come with that the other thing is that being in such a large city um, the climate or the the issues that are happening in the city impact this facility greatly so in the majority of Dorum Ganota's history, um, we had a steady number of people come through our doors, right? You know, very steady number, not, not massive, not small, just a steady number. And then in the last four years or three years, when the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, gave their 94 recommendations, um, it really, really impacted us significantly. Um, we're we went up 54% in terms of the number of people coming through our doors, not, not taking into account the amount of emails or phone calls for inquiries, because all of a sudden, everybody was interested in the Indigenous 
topic and issue and peoples and history and they had these 94 recommendations and the government internally all levels of government universities colleges everybody was like what do we do with this and um unfortunately there hasn't been a lot of resources put towards that education piece so there's this rec these recommendations but where are the resources to meet the recommendations in terms of education to the public and so this little facility in the heart of Toronto, all of a sudden was <laughs> bombarded by all these individuals at, from everywhere, from interested Canadians, um, you know, moms and dads wanting their kids or themselves to learn a bit more to, you know, priests and nuns, to school board directors, to federal directors and employees, to doctors, to lawyers, everyone came to our door and said, help us understand <laughs> And, um, and I'm one person employed in the facility. So we really had to step back and look at what are our resources and what's our mandate and how can we meet the need. Um, and so we created our programming. Um, we created something called the Indigenous Awareness 101 session. Um, and I created that because a lot of the agencies in the city we're also being bombarded by individuals coming and asking them for help and support and awareness building. But those agencies are mandated for the healing of the First Nation Métis Inuit community members and the staff are already so incredibly busy and, you know, over overworked and underpaid and all that stuff. And a lot of times people would come into the friendship centers and ask, you know, youth employees, you know, what's your take on residential schools? And they don't realize that that very question triggers a whole whole amount of trauma. And so when I talk to the community, one of the things they said is we need to be able to get them to go somewhere and have them slow down because they're, you know, it's, it's a lot for us and um, we have a lot on our plate and um, it's not necessarily our responsibility to to answer these questions. And so I was trying to help our community. And so I created the Indigenous Awareness 101 session here at the lodge. Um, and also because a lot of the grandmothers and grandfathers or elders in the facility were asking um, people to slow down, right? They were kind of running before they even walked. And so they were visiting elders without even really knowing the basics of protocol of how to approach them or what even our medicines are about or how or the difference between indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing versus in a western way of relating and so the indigenous awareness 101 session was created about three years ago um, to give people the basics right to help them understand the difference between the world views how you approach people and give them some guidance on some steps they can take um, in, in, in building those relationships. Um, just basic stuff like how do you smudge? Why do you smudge? How do you make a tobacco bundle? Um, or, you know, the difference between a Western scientific approach versus an indigenous scientific approach. Um, and, and also getting them to look at their perception that they're bringing into the room and their, um, their uh, biases, I guess, and getting them. But really, bottom line was to slow people down <laughs> and really become aware of um, themselves. And so that, that session came about. And th that, that was some of the challenges. And some of the other challenges that we face is there tends to be a romanticism about indigenous people, indigenous healing, and um, a lot of people who are disgruntled with a Western, either medical system, education system, um, uh, government system, tend to want to um, then grab onto an indigenous um, way. And they come, and they think that the elders will be the solution, and they tend to romanticize our way of life, right? And so um, those are challenges that we face right now in particular. And so a lot of people will have um, this kind of unrealistic view of indigenous people and, and come and, and, and idolize, I guess, or, or put elders and knowledge keepers on a pedestal and not necessarily see us as human beings, right? 
So we struggle with all of that. And um, a lot of people would call never having known anything about indigenous history or rights or nations or what a clan is or have never engaged with any of that, but would call and say, I need to go to a sweat lodge now, right? And we would really struggle with that. And a lot of times, um, obviously cultural appropriation, you struggle with that a lot. So Dodo Ganota has, has had those <laughs> conversations as how do we, how do we make sure that we're doing relationship building in the best way possible and ensuring that um, those that come through our doors um, are welcomed, are held in a safe space, but at the same time are challenged on their perceptions, on their beliefs, and also um, are able to um, receive and be given truth because um, you have to be willing to see some of those truths about yourself in order for those relationships to move forward in a good way. So we've had to really look at how do you do that, right? Um, how do you, and we've, we've put things in place like the Awareness 101 education session that I facilitate before they even uh, meet the elders or knowledge keepers. Um, in order for me to have some of those harder conversations with them and to slow them down a little bit and then they can go to the next step which is beginning to build those relationships right so why can't you just come right um, through our doors and be put into a sweat lodge ceremony you know why is that you know not the best way right or why getting your spirit name is not the first thing that you want to do in your journey of reconciliation, right? Um, and so, but having compassion, right? Knowing that there's reasons these are their their first actions or first approach, right? So having a lot of compassion, but also um, being able to um, have that hard conversation, right? So I do that awareness 101, that's my role here. Slow people down a bit. <laughs> For me, that's been a really important question, especially being the manager of an education and culture facility <laughs> where I design and program um, everything that happens here. So I've had many experiences in my life in which um, those grandmothers or grandfathers or my parents or my community or indigenous um, teachers have helped me find answers to that question, what is Indigenous education? And the best way for me to describe it is, as Indigenous people, we have these beautiful creation stories. And many people will tell you, go back to the creation story when you're looking for answers to questions that you have about life or about who you are or how you move forward in life. So as Indigenous people, especially rooted within those creation stories, I would say that what was so beautiful about our way of life, our people, our nations, our communities, was that we truly understood what it meant to be a human being. That we really understood um, that as a human being, you're going to travel through these life stages, you're going to travel through this life experience, um, and you're going to face many challenges. And those challenges are not bad. They're actually there in order for you to transform what we would call integrate the darkness or those challenges or that contrast, transform it into what we would call wisdom for the purpose of propelling you forward throughout your life. And how you see that is how indigenous nations explain the stages of life. So. When you look at that, for example, that medicine wheel, you're going to go through various stages in life. And you're going to go through the infant, the child, the youth, the young adult, the adult, the, the older adult, and then the grandparent stage. And your spirit is not aging, but it is becoming um, more developed. And so for the Mayan people, as an example, my people believe that you are this beautiful little seed represented by the corn that is inside of your thymus or your immune system area. 
And your spinal cord is that lifeline that you've come and agreed to live, right? That intention you've come to this world. And so that little star seed gets planted and then you travel through your life experience and develop that star seed, right? You, you come, so you're planted into the womb of the earth, which is your mom, right? And you're developing for nine levels, which is if you look at a Mayan pyramid, it's nine levels, right? And so you're here developing and being molded. And we would say that it's the grandmother, Ishmukane, the moon, that's molding you and you stem from the seed of the sun. So you're a little star seed, a little light that's developing. And they say that as you journey, there is going to need, uh, you're going to need some, some support because this life here in a human life where you feel everything, your body is a sentient body, it's a feeling body, you're going to need to learn how to transform the experiences inside the womb of the earth, right? And so we understood, we didn't have a romantic vision of the human life. We didn't say, you're going to come here and everything is going to be in harmony and you're going to just dance around and just going to be all these beautiful. That is life. But life is also contrast. So as Mayan people, as indigenous people, we understood that if you're coming into a physical life experience, all physical matter requires a positive charge and a negative charge, right? And but there is a neutral charge too, and you can neutralize the positive and the negative. So we understood that. We understood that you are coming into a world, a physical world, in which there will be contrast, meaning there will be a dark side to it, a shadowy side to it. And so we had ceremonies and teachings in place throughout every life stage that would support you as you travel along your life path so that you will always be able to come back to what my people call the point of zero, the point of light and innocence. So you travel and you experience all these things in life, but you had ceremonies and life, life teachings for every stage that would help you integrate what we would call the darkness and more wisdom and come back to that point of zero, that point of light. So what that tells you, I can talk about this for years, right? But what that tells you is then we as Indigenous people understood what it meant to be human. And we understood that as a human being, your life itself is the learning. <laughs> and that you've come here because you're to learn, right? Through life itself. So we didn't put anyone in a classroom to sit and learn what other people have experienced we would just sit, we would allow you to go through life and experience your own stuff. And we would guide you through the ceremonies or the teachings to understand your own experience for the purpose of becoming your own wisdom. So what, what that's very different because if you notice the Western education system, you'll go to school and you're basically asked to take all this information and retain it, memorize it, and then be tested on how much you've retained. And nobody really, really asks or cares what you think about, maybe only once you get to your PhD level, but your master's is mastering what's already been written out there by the experts, right? So as indigenous people, indigenous education at the core sees the human being as the expert, but not as a given. You're the expert in your ability to engage with life experiences and transform those experiences into wisdom itself. So do you know how many times I have climbed trees that I have fallen from, having grandmothers and grandfathers look at me climb, know that I'm going to fall from that tree, but not at one time ever stopped me from climbing that tree. And I never quite understood that until I realized that what they were doing was allowing me to learn from the experience myself. And why is that so important? It's the difference between knowing versus becoming the teaching. So indigenous knowledge, indigenous ways, indigenous education understands that if all you ever, the only way that you learn is from getting information, all it is is an understanding. But to actually integrate it so that you become that knowledge, so that you are peace, 
not just understand peace, but you become peace, you must have a lived experience of it first. And that lived experience is often in the contrast. So for example, I was born in war. So how do I understand peace? Because I understand the opposite of it, which is war. But it's not just in the experience of war, it's in the capacity through ceremonies, through healing ceremonies to transform the experience into a wisdom of peace. So how do I know peace? Because I've integrated the experience of war and transformed it. And so that's a really different way to see, but that to me is indigenous education. So in many ways, you're like a cell phone, right? All these things come at you and then you process it to re, uh, give a message, right? And so as Indigenous people, Indigenous education, my job as a knowledge holder, my job as a teacher is not to make you believe what I believe, but to, to share what my experience has been in helping you move through your lived experience and come to your own conclusion. So I'm not here to tell you what to choose. I'm simply here to tell you, you do have a choice. That's how I understand Indigenous education. And so um, that's a very different way, but it's a very important way. And um, often people will, the next question they'll ask me is, well, how do you transform the experience into wisdom? And in every nation, especially on the American, what they call the American continent, from the tip of the north to the tip of the south. Our teachings and our expressions are very unique and different. How we receive them from the ancestors and spirit world is very different. But at the core of it, they will always tell you that you are an elemental being. So you're made up of air, you have earth, you have fire called the spirit, and then you have water. And when those four elements are in balance, the body begins to process and transform at the level of the cells. And so anytime that you go into indigenous ceremonies, where are they gonna put you within the elements? All ceremonies will have our medicines, our, which is the earth, we'll have our water, we'll ask you to breathe in a sweat lodge, you're gonna have to know how to breathe deeply to activate the healing properties in the body and in the medicines. So we're, we understood ourselves as elemental beings. So here's the other thing, you're born elemental. So in indigenous education, we automatically know that you were born with the best technology ever created, which is an elemental body. So all you have to learn how to do is work the technology, which is your elemental body. So what do indigenous people do? We teach our kids when they're little about their elements, eh? That's why every ceremony we're on the land, we're working with all the parts of creation, which are all the parts of you, so that you know how to work your technology, your body for the purpose of transformation. So you're connected to a spirit world, an energy world that is, that has massive, massive amount of consciousness. And so not only um, do you live these experiences and then use the elemental body to transform it into wisdom and knowing, but also your cells are completely connected to the spiritual world in which you can also bring forward consciousness to share with the world. That's why, if you notice, indigenous knowledge keepers, elders, or grandmas and grandfathers, people will say, how come they don't have any notes? How come they just get up there and start talking? Or how come they can lead a whole circle and not have any notes? And then <laughs> they're always looking for PowerPoint presentations. And they say, how do you do that? Well, because we know that we're connected to all our relations. So not only does your body transform experience into wisdom, your body is also connected to everything that exists, all your relations. And so it can also bring forward wisdom to share with the world. And uh, some people in our modern times will call that channeling. But um, so we're internally referenced. So the expert is you, <laughs> right? 
by engaging with what you were built with naturally. And so how much does education cost? Nothing. Because you're, you're it, <laughs> right? So you don't have to go to six years of university. So somebody will say, hey, you know something about the world. We know that the minute you're born into the womb of the earth, she will give you nutrients. She will give you, you just, she's gonna mold you, right? And it's in your, that's your birthright. So you're learning as well as teaching at the same time. So in my culture, they actually tell you what that seed is. So my seed would be wakib dihash, which means um, a flint knife, like a medicine knife. So when, when I'm born, my parents know that they've just given birth to this little seed called dihash. So they know that I'm a medicine being, that I've come to learn about what it means to cut negativity like a knife, like the blade of a knife. And it's the volcanic blade, the volcanic knife glass that comes from obsidian, right? So they know that I'm going to be very sharp attitude too, right? So they know that I'm on this journey to discover what it means to not only be medicine, but to gift the medicine to my people. Another star seed might be what we call the hummingbird or eek, which is the breath of life. So if a parent gives birth to this little baby who the elders say that's the breath of life, they know that that baby is going to journey to discover what it means to breathe life into themselves and then share it with the world as to how to breathe life into themselves. So not only are you the learner, you're also the educator the minute that you come into this world. That's very different because it's all an internal process. It's all about discovering who you are and, and how to gift who you are to the world for the benefit and well-being of your community as a whole. So there is no such thing as the leader in an indigenous community. There's no such thing as the teacher in an indigenous community. There's all these beautiful seeds going through the process of life. And then when they come to the grandmother and grandfather stage, they're to share what their experience has been through life. Share being the word, right? And then just to guide the other seeds that are going through it. But it's a given that every single being that is born into the physical world is going to be a leader in the community within their own gifts or their own seed or their own teachings. That's a very different way. And also, I feel I feel called to add that um, this, the other part for that, for me, that's really important is to understand that in, in, in the creation stories I've heard, including my own people's, that the, we didn't come to just know this. We didn't know that tobacco was the way you talk to the spirit world. We didn't know that, you know, um, for the Mayan people, we wear beautiful weaving, weaved clothing. It's gorgeous, stunning, um, called the wipir for the women, right? And um, so all of those things that our people know how to do, all those ceremonies and all those um, teachings that we carry and knowing that we're elemental beings and all comes from the teachings we originally received from the parts of creation. And I feel really called to remind people of that and to say that because um, my vision for the future in Indigenous education is to remember, um, to honor those original teachers. And those original teachers are the animals. You know, I show people often when I do presentations, um, I show a Mayan woman weaving her, her um, traditional clothes and then I show a video of the spider when the spider spits out the, the its thread and she starts to weave. That's where we got it from. Um, and or when I talk to people about that medicine wheel comes from the that deer, that deer that teaches you balance and how to be a sentient being. That deer can sense 
when something's out of harmony, so she teaches us balance again, or the crocodile in my people's culture teaches us what it means to know how to calm that mind so you don't bite somebody else's head off, right? Or that water teaches us about purification and cleansing and you're made up of how much percentage of water and those thunder beings teach us how, you know, when they sh shoot their thunder, it clears the air, we can breathe better right after a thunderstorm. And they teach us that when you come into a room and there's a lot of tension, if somebody were just to be real and tell the truth as sharp as a thunderbolt, it would clear the air in that room real quick and then we can get back to the creation, right? So all those things, all that wisdom that indigenous nations carry came from somewhere. And those original teachers, my vision is that we'll remember to honor them. We'll remember to, that a lot of the questions we have, a lot of the stresses that we have, a lot of the worries that we're experiencing today, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel. Like we, we don't have to really stress ourselves out and you know, you don't really have to battle each other for funding on how to create a, a successful youth program to deal with anxiety, you might want to remember that to plant corn, like our ancestors originally taught us, our grandmother Ishmukane, right, originally taught us, will help with that. Why? Because she taught us that when you plant corn, that little child, when he plants corn, that little seed into the earth and sees that corn grow into a full, full stock that, and then pulls the corn and makes tortillas to feed his people, that little child is reminded of their capacity to manifest, right? To be able to create and they're not gonna be so afraid about survival or feel all this anxiety about getting it right because they might not be able to make it out there, which is what most teenagers are experiencing today, an anxiety of life, a fear of life. Just plant some corn so the child will see that they have a relationship with the earth and they can plant these seeds that will grow into full life, physical life. What are seeds? They're thoughts. Right? So a child knows that their thoughts will manifest in a physical world. So we don't have to go and panic about how do we create a successful youth program to deal with these modern issues. We, we have to go back to those original teachings and remember what our, our uh, original teachers taught us on what it is to live a good way. And the more important thing to understand, in my opinion, about that is that I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you saw kind of an animal in the wild, right? And you just saw them and you were like, oh, or, you were, or you stopped maybe and for maybe a, a short second, there was a pause of like this intense moment. It's like a sh small time. And I believe that happens is because you're both recognizing each other. So when we talk about a deer, it's not that the deer is separate, it's the deer is teaching you of what you have within yourself that is the deer. So all the parts of creation external are really internal. So balance is inside of you represented externally by the deer, but it's really a part of who you are. So if you really want to know what it means to be a human, a successful human, a, a healthy human, and live a good life, you would go to the original teachers that remind you of the parts that you have inside of you that are reflected within them, right? And so my vision is that we will realize that we're not supposed to be suffering or struggling here, that um, we were really given everything, but the one thing we're going to have to remember is what we would call humility, <laughs> right? Because deers, you know, they don't attend meetings and they don't email and they don't text you. You have to go out into the bush and build a relationship with them. And I, that's my vision, that we'll go back to those original teachers um, because we've lost our way a little bit, right? I'm excited. I think for many people, it'll be the best of times. And for many other people, it'll be very hard times. Um, 
but I I'm excited because I feel that humanity is going to begin to discover how powerful we really are. And in order to understand the degree of power, often you have to completely surrender, right? So you always experience the opposite to understand, right? And so I believe humanity is in a position right now where they're going to ask some really important questions about their way of life, about government, about education, and about health care, um, which tends to be in a Western or mainstream system, very externally referenced, right? So the experts are outside of us, right? And or the power is outside of us, right? Which is why we take to the streets and we protest because we're asking for the recognition of our rights. And whenever you see that extreme uh, feeling of disempowerment, I know that what that means is you're also going to give birth to the opposite of it from an indigenous perspective, right? An indigenous way of knowing. And so that means that this entire time that we've been experiencing this oppression or injustices and violence and discrimination, that we're also giving birth to an, a different reality. And so what happens when an individual is made to feel like they have no power? I believe what will happen ultimately is the discovery of true power and the collapse of the illusion that power could ever have existed outside of you, right? And if you look at the systems and structures that are in place right now, including education, you'll start to realize that it's been a system that's been built from historical experiences, almost like a trauma response system, a system that it's like a little kid that's been hurt so badly and has had to survive for so long that decides to build this little club called privilege and 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 decides who's going to be in you know benefit from it and who's not like a little club like you can belong and you can't belong right but really the little child is trying to protect itself it's trying to control its destiny it's it's out of fear and it's out of survival and it's out of um a belief of scarcity, not enough, right? And so they're trying to hold on to this power and and they watch the people outside try to get into this to this club. We might call that privilege, right? But it's not a, a state of growth. It's not a state of creativity and it's not a state of expansion, right? Because at the core of it is trying to control, right? And so when you look at that, that's kind of how I would describe our current um, systems and structures. Um, but I know that the individuals that are fighting or trying to get into this, this what I call this club, will also be caused to eventually discover that that's never where power has ever been. And so why I say I'm excited is because I believe humanity is on the brink of discovering something so deep within inside of themselves that they realize that they've never, ever lost. And then in fact, they are, all the current circumstances are pushing us to really discover that, that infinite and expansive and beautiful, divinely gifted um, power that we carry inside. Not arrogance, not control, that's not what I'm talking. I'm not talking about force, right? I'm talking about that real power and we'll begin to see us ourselves as highly evolved, creative, spiritual beings having a physical human experience, right? That's my definition of humanity, right? And so I, I'm excited because I, I begin to realize that all that pressure, all that darkness that we've experienced will be integrated for the possibility of discovering who we really are and what we're really capable of. And that the minute that we begin to tap into that, and we will tap into it because our current circumstances are push pushing us or collapsing us to ask those questions deeper. They're, it's almost like it's it's an intensity that's it's kind of pushing us to really ask these questions. And then it's like you're, you'll discover it, kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, where she finally realizes she was wearing the shoes she could have tapped this whole entire time. 
And I feel like that's what we're on the brink of discovering or what I call our master selves. And to begin to realize that we are creative beings and we have the capacity of transforming our external world on a level that I don't think we've ever experienced, but you can only understand that if you've been able to tap into it on the inside. So I get excited because I realized that one of the biggest tragedies, in my opinion, from the process of colonization or conquest that happened to my people or indigenous people is this belief that the creator is somehow outside of you. So the separation from creator or from creation. So, and that tends to, to be a, a common thing that I hear when I go to ceremonies, people will, say, will plead to the creator, they'll plead to creation. Um, but in my meditation or time spent fasting, I fast every year, or the time spent working with the grandmothers and grandfathers, in a lot of our teachings, that doesn't really, it's not there. The creator is all that exists and it's actually inside of you. So when you say creator, please help us, who are you really talking to but yourself? <laughs> a higher part, or part of yourself that's actually connected to all that exists, all your relations, right? So you're not separate, you're, all, you're connected in, and intertwined at all times. So that's a powerful thing to discover, not here, but to discover here when you really feel it and you begin to see the spirit and everything that exists, including this chair or this beautiful facility or all these sacred items, that's why we call them sacred because they all carry a spirit. And that spirit is the creator and, and it's inside of us as well. So when you start to discover that, you discover a power and, and that fear begins to go away because you start to realize, wait a second, I'm actually creating all of this. Yep, you are creating all of this. And then instead of looking at the external world to change for you to be in a good place, you start to explore the self. And that's where, where all I think everything will change when the self is explored, but not so that you can say, I'm powerful, but eventually, in the exploration of the self, you will actually transcend the self. And when you transcend the self, you actually realize all your relations, that interconnectedness. And you would never, ever be able to harm another individual because you see them as you. So often people will say, well, Maria, if people believe that they're the creator, isn't that a, a very dangerous place? And I said, no way. Because the only way to truly, like if you really understood yourself as the creator, it means that you would also see it in everybody else. That's how you know you got there. <laughs> so you wouldn't harm. <laughs> you see, you can't, it's it's not possible. If, if you don't see it in everybody else, then you, you haven't seen it in yourself yet. So it's kind of a, a natural law that um, take, takes care of itself, eh? And so I, I'm, I'm excited for that. So I don't see what we're going through um, as something I want to push away or get rid of. I believe in the capacity of the human being to transform. So I often tell people this is a world where anything goes, this planet, the earth. Um, this is a world where, where you have what we call free will and you are powerful and creative, you can create anything in this world. And oftentimes that scares people, right? Because it means you can create weapons and, and war and all this stuff. But I also know that you were built and designed with an elemental body that can also meet free will head on and has the capacity to transform anything. So instead of being afraid of the darkness, you would you would engage with it and integrate it to become more light. That's powerful when you discover that. So you don't lock all your doors trying to push darkness out of your home. You would recognize the power within yourself to transform and integrate the darkness. And when that kind of fear dissipates, you welcome life again. And I, that's why I'm excited. 
And so my vision for Indigenous education is going to be that we're finally going to realize that it's the self that needs to be explored. The human capacity needs to be explored. And from my time with many um, experts in the field, not only of Indigenous education, you know, um, but also other experts that are not Indigenous in the quantum science and the quantum fields, they're saying the same thing, that our education system has to change and it's going to collapse because it's not working out anymore. And what people are more curious about is well-being and what does it mean to be human. And Indigenous people, guess what? We have thousands and thousands of years of practice and knowledge around that question. So what is our biggest contribution to the future? We're going to share with people what we know about what it means to human to be human beings. So indigenous people will will be leading the way without a doubt. We'll be leading the way if we can also heal and transform the darkness and experience of colonization and integrate it into wisdom to move all of humanity forward. I don't believe we can lead the way holding on to that narrative and that hurt of colonization and conquest. We must first be willing as indigenous people to remember who we are and our stories and our languages and our ceremonies so that we can integrate that dark experience transform it into more light and lead the way for the rest of humanity to find out who they really are.